Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am here today with Lil Cross, and we are going to be talking about all things how to make money as a musician, which I know you guys are tuned in for. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to the Profitable Musician Show or the Female Entrepreneur Musician Show or wherever you're listening to this on. So um, before we jump into all the nitty gritty details about making money and scaling your business and all those things, uh, I would love to have you just let the listeners know uh, about your background as an artist, how you got into music, kind of your musical journey up till now, and how you uh, started your current company and collective called Dead to the World. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I want to start off by saying thanks so much for having me. I'm a fan of the podcast. I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah. My name is Lil Cross. Um, I'm 21 years old. I'm based in uh, Tampa, Florida. Um, I've been making music my whole life. Uh, started putting it out around like 2016, um, became a full-time musician just within the last couple of years. Um, in high school, around that 2016 era, when I started making music, um, I was making music with my friends, um, just, a, you know, friends from high school that, you know, kind of inspired me to actually start creating. And um, we called ourselves Dead to the World. Um, a lot of those people didn't stick with it. Um, but over time, I continued to uh, pursue it um, both, you know, as a hobby, like for fun and as a career. Um, and eventually uh, met different artists along the way who I've added to the collective who are more dedicated, uh, more passionate um, and who are people who, you know, kind of matched my energy in that regard. Um, and some of them are just artists that I work with. Um, and then two of those individuals, uh, Gumby DTW and uh, Ethan Marino. Um, we all three started a company together, which is also called Dead to the World. And that company focuses on, obviously we release music as a collective as well. Um, but our company focuses on, um, hosting events. Uh, we have an, uh, event venue and a recording studio. So we do, uh, uh, like session recording as well. Um, and then our main offer is, um, a consultation course where we, um, teach independent artists how to uh, monetize and uh, create offers out of their music. Um, and we also specialize in helping artists host events as well. That's awesome. I mean, I, first I've got to say you're only 21. Like You may be the youngest person I've had on this podcast, which is really cool. Um, and so how did you kind of go from doing the artist stuff and running a venue and running a studio and all that to the education side of helping artists? Great question. So um, I was kind of in a free for all with the original artist stuff in that regard, because it was just like, I was just doing whatever I could to make money off my craft. Right. Um, so I had just moved out. Um, unfortunately I got kicked out of college. So I kind of was like left with no other choice, but like, Hey, I'm either going to keep working at checkers or I'm going to, you know, figure out a way to make money off the music. So I, I was already like mixing and mastering my own stuff, which was at first a means to save money from like actually going to the studio. So I started actually hosting my um, like studio sessions for other artists, which was just in my apartment. Um, and then the event started out like me and my friends, like Dead to the World, like just splitting costs on a venue. Um, and it wasn't a thing where it was intentional make, to make profit, but we did because, you know, we sold so many tickets and stuff that it ended up outweighing the cost that, you know, each of us spent on the venue. So then it became a thing where I was like, well, if I can learn how to do this more often, if I can learn how to scale, if I can learn how to sell more tickets, um, stuff like that, I can make more money. So I started just hosting events in studio time, blah, 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 right? Um, I came to my friends. It was just like a, a thing that we were doing to make money. And I pitched it to them. And I was like, hey, let's license this as a business. Let's go out there. Let's find a commercial like place that we can start renting that it's our own venue so we can cut down on operating expenses and 
that's also, we also built a studio in house so I didn't have to record people in my apartment anymore. Um, and as people were coming in, a few things. First of all, there's a ceiling for scalability with that, right? Especially like we don't have a massive venue capacity is like 200. There's only so much we can make off events with getting, selling out the event. Everyone's buying merch there. Everyone's buying, you know, food and drinks. There's only so much money we can make, right? And so often that we can host events. Same thing with studio time. You can only charge so much for studio time. It's always an hourly thing. So there's only so many hours in the day. So there's a ceiling for scalability in that regard. So that was something that came to my mind. Um, but in general, we were doing artist consultations and that was just out of necessity. So many artists were coming to us, simple things. They didn't know how to set up their PROs, their PRAs, their distribution, that kind of stuff. Um, so we'd just be like, okay, well, if you want to pay us for another hour after the studio time, like we'll just charge you the same rate as the studio time, but like, we'll just sit down with you and help you get it distributed, you know, licensed, stuff like that. Um, and, uh, I actually hired some coaches. I hired some mentors and, um, they were like, hey, this is the real money maker. Like this consulting is the real, has a way higher ceiling for the scalability, which is what I was looking for. So that's when we kind of packaged it into a scalable offer um, to where a lot of it is relied on modules now. So it's, and, and group meetings. So it's less relying on our one-on-one -on -one time. Um, there's a lot bigger of a transformation. It's much higher ticket now. So it's not like, hey, just come in and spend 50 bucks and then you can come back whenever you want. It's like, no, you have to be committed to the whole course. You have to be committed to, from start to finish, getting from where you're at right now to being a full-time musician, right? So um, we just kind of repackaged it in a, in a way that allowed us to increase in our fulfillment and uh, actually be able to scale. Yeah, that's that's really smart. Now, are you doing this mostly in person or you have online offerings as well? It's all on, online at this point. It's all online, okay. Yeah. And then like the only in-person stuff is like someone's at the studio and because they're around us and they know about us, they hear about our consulting, but it's like, and we have a lot of people that are upsold from studio time or events to the actual course, but it's not like we're driving to each other's houses to have meetings. You know, a lot of this, this, this consulting stuff is like daily communication. So even the people who are within like physical reach of us, we're still communicating with them electronically. Got it. So I'm curious, you know, when you're teaching musicians, how they can build their business, how they can scale all of that stuff. And what you just talked about your own journey, you know, are you mostly encouraging them to do what you did as far as like the consulting is the, where the good money is, you know, and I'm curious about this because I know that kind of our industry gets into the, like this, this, you know, coaches, coaching coaches to coach, you know what I mean? So you feel like it's just this like domino effect of everybody coaching everybody else and like who's out there actually doing the stuff. So do you have people that are out there performing out there, uh, maybe also running a studio or teaching or whatever, as well as maybe doing kind of the coaching that you're doing for them? So that's a great question. And there's, there's a lot of different sides that there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, first and foremost, a lot of the times the reason why it becomes that linear, like coach, 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 coach is because it works. So uh, <laughs> like sometimes when you're focused on fulfillment, you know, it's scary to like, Hey, let's sell merchandise. When it's like, if we're selling something merchandise for 20 bucks, instead of like selling this course for 2000 bucks, that's literally times in, you know, the amount of clients we need to become lucrative by a hundred. Right. So it's like it, we're able to fulfill better, especially because also the business that we've built and the business that we've been able to scale is a coaching based business. So the best advice I could give is in print and in alignment with that. With that being said, I'm very adamant on like the whole reason I created this course is to help empower artists and do what they love doing for a living. So if they don't love coaching, but they love making music, then the path for them is not to be a coach. I do think it's important to understand though a few things. First of all, when you're starting any business, you're going to have to there's going to be a few months, years of suck before you really get to that point where things are a little bit more outsourced and, you know, you can actually focus on the music. So regardless of what it is an artist is selling, there's the actual work component involved. There's the actual, let's say it is getting booked for shows, right? Because they love performing. They don't love coaching. Every hour you spend on stage performing, you're going to spend dozens of hours creating your pitch, sending it to different venues, you know, learning how that works. So again, like you can get to a point where you use your money and time and knowledge as leverage to be able to just focus on music and kind of have passive things generating revenue or things that you know, like getting booked for events that are so easy that 
you've outsourced those systems to other people like booking agents and stuff like that. But in order to get that point, you're going to have to do the groundwork period. So sometimes that groundwork is coaching and then you can outsource the fulfillment to other people. Um, or sometimes that groundwork is hosting events, which is another popular one because, you know, people like love performing. So a lot of times it's like, Hey, let's do the suck of like putting this event together and dealing with other artists, but so we can make money off of our music and make that money performing. Um, you know, that the offers manifest themselves in different ways, but I think kind of regardless across the board, you're going to have to pick between like money or time. And, um, I think time buys money. So I think like the, most logical option is to do the most lucrative thing first and then use that thing as leverage to get your time back and do what you want with that time. I like that you're saying that. And I feel like when I first started coaching musicians, nobody wanted to say that because it wasn't, it wasn't sexy or it was, it was just like, but I want to do music and I want this music to make me the money that I want. But we have to admit that sometimes especially in the beginning, that's not the case. Right. And we've got to do what we got to do, whether it's, doing something else in the music industry, teaching, coaching, et cetera, or like literally having a whole nother job um, on the side in order to, to bolster yourself up so you can get to that level. Cause like you said, it does take a few years, right. To really get your systems going and that whole like snowball going downhill kind of thing, instead of feeling like you're always pushing it up the hill. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that's in any case, like, I think that in times before, I think we're more empowered than ever. So what I mean by that is we're less relying on labels, managers, a &Rs, other things to actually take a hold of our own careers. So, I mean, that means a few things. Yes, it means we're more empowered, but also now those responsibilities lie upon us. So we have a few options. We can just make a music and we can just hope that someone walks by and holds our hand and then a label signs us and takes ownership of half of our stuff and does all that work for us. And we just focus on making music, but that's based on the contingent of getting lucky enough for that label to find you. And also based on the contingent of them taking a large percentage of your money away, or you can acknowledge that regardless of the path that you take, it's going to require work outside of it. I, I can't think of a way that someone's getting paid right now through musicianship that didn't require work outside of music, even if it's people who don't have like a big offer or anything like that. They only, they just built up a bunch of notoriety and now they're getting booked for shows. They're getting brand deals, sync placements, et cetera. How did they build up the, that notoriety? They probably made a bunch of content on TikTok or Instagram reels. And that content is not music. You spent hours making content. You spent hours doing work so you can get attention to the music itself. I don't know anyone that just goes to the studio, makes great music and doesn't do any work outside of that. And then somehow ends up getting paid millions of dollars for a hundred thousand dollars for, I don't, I've never seen it happen. No, that's a really good point. And like you said, even if you're a musician creating content, that content leads to the music, but it isn't the music. So you're actually creating a whole nother thing and it's like a whole nother job, right? 100% because now it doesn't matter how good the music is, you can't maintain the output and the quality of the content. It doesn't, everything falls apart. So I think the question is less of like, you know, if I can only do music and more so like, acknowledging that you're going to have to work in some other area, gain some other skill in order to monetize the music. So picking between all the options that you have to find the one that works best for you. You know, oftentimes it's like, it's not as bad as people make it out to be. Like when you, when we start making music, we suck at first, the same thing is going to happen with content. And then you learn to love it. Like, and if you're creative enough to be a musician, you're probably creative enough to, to make some cool content. And I'm sure that if you applied yourself in practice, instead of being like, you know, uptight and you know kind of like entitled and like oh well i gr make great music so everything else should just fall into place if you actually go out there you know you might have some fun making some content you know yeah none of this like like you said entitled like well i'm an artist i don't do that you know so um I, you know and that brings up in my mind like as artists we do need to have a way to get leads or fans or whatever we want to call them um, you know, us in the internet marketing world, we'll call them leads. A lot of musicians are more like fans or potential fans or listeners or whatever. But, you know, how can you attract those perfect people? And how do you know who those perfect people are, in your opinion? Great question. So I think that uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to make the distinction between fans and customers, because we're you. a lot of people use these terms interchangeably. If your goal is to make money off your music, I wouldn't necessarily consider a fan a lead. 
Um, because what I mean by that is unless you have an offer that is directly pertaining to that fan, that's not your music. The only thing they're a genuine lead of is streaming your song. And that's not a lucrative enough source of revenue for that to be substantial or that to be meaningful. So sure, you have a fan that loves you and is streaming you. But if they stream you 100 times, Spotify is giving you like a third of a penny. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like that doesn't actually amount to anything. So first, I think like, you have to make that distinction. Are you looking for fans of your music? Are you looking for validation? Are you looking for a number next to a song? Are you, or are you looking for a number in a bank account? Are you looking for an mm -hmm. actual lead that you can actually sell something to? I think just making that distinction alone is half, like it's the only thing a lot of people need to just move forward and actually be able to create a path to that goal. I would say that um, when it comes to genuinely attracting leads, whether that be a lead for the music or a lead for an actual offer you have, I think, um, first of all, content is a necessity. I think what a lot of people do is a lot of times they jump to marketing. Marketing is great for scaling something that works. Marketing shouldn't be the thing that makes it work in the first place. So what I mean by that, that is if your content isn't good enough to generate you fans or leads organically, then chances are when you market yourself, those people are going to do what? They're going to start looking at your content. Your content isn't good enough so that marketing isn't going to pay off. It's not going to actually amount to anything. So the better the organic content is, the better the actual marketing is going to be. So I think first things first when it comes to acquiring leads is, is making good content that's actually in alignment with um, what the lead wants to see, what the lead wants to hear, and then kind of using the data and analysis from whatever pieces of content attracted the most leads to just then market that, you know, understand what your audience is, um, you know, input some, some of their interests and stuff into a Facebook ad and then boost specifically the, or the post that was already generating leads organically. It was already working without money put into it. If that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I like that. I, for sure. Organic is so good for testing, right? You can throw all kinds of different angles and things like that out there and see what sticks and what people really resonate with. And then you can then put the money behind that. So I'm curious when you say marketing, because I think of organic also as marketing, but when you say marketing, you're more like the organic is testing and the marketing starts when you start paying like for ads and things. So when I'm, when I'm saying marketing, I'm specifically referring to, to paid marketing. Okay. Yeah. Like marketing technically can be the organic too. And I also want to mention like um, the testing should be, limited we shouldn't just be kind of like throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks <laughs> if that makes sense like yeah. what we need to do is we need to identify who our person is so this is a practice that's done by almost every business out there but a lot of artists don't think about the business side of things or they haven't been educated on it so essentially it's working backwards from like who your product is designed for so if it's an actual product or service like a piece of merchandise for example right that's what you're monetizing or a show that's going to look different than like a fan of your music. So like if you're making content for someone to buy tickets to your event because you want to get booked for events, then you have to make content that's not just for someone to become a fan of your music, but it's for someone who always goes to concerts for artists that they like to become a fan of your music because you have to understand what you're marketing them to. Now, if it's just a fan of your music, still it's like, who's your perfect client? Um, what, what, what you need to do is picture the individual who is most in need of what it is that you're trying to, to market, right? So let's say it is a song and the song is about like, you know, a, a, a breakup, like something that you went through, right? Who is the person that is most in need of hearing that right now? Maybe someone that recently went through a breakup that was, and get as specific as possible. If you're specific in the song about why you broke up, the dynamic of the relationship, then include those specificities in the content so that the actual individual who is most in need and who would be most inclined to be interested in that song is being spoken to when they're seeing your content. So they actually, it's actually creating a bridge for that individual to understand this is incentive for me to go to this song. You know, I relate and resonate to the advertising for it in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I definitely agree that I agree with that. I think I can imagine that our listeners, at least some of them might be thinking, well, does that mean that I have different fan bases for each song that I have? Because, you know, one song might be about breakups and then another song might be about, you know, some really heavy, serious 
subject, uh, you know, that's very maybe controversial or political or something like that, you know, we obviously don't write about the same thing all the time. So, you know, is there is there transition between those people as there overlap? Or are you thinking more on an individual when you're marketing a song is like, these are the people for this. These are the people for this. These are the people for my shows, you know, are these all different buckets? And then there's just some that overlap. So I, I think that there's genuine overlap most of the time. I think that a lot of times this is an entry point into being a fan of someone, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that when someone buys into the song, they buy into the brand, then that gives you leverage for them to make the assumption that they're going to like the next song. And oftentimes that's the reason why they even listen to it in the first place and give it a chance to like it, right? So like if I think about my favorite artist, I love their album, their next album before it comes out because of the fact that I'm such a fan of their previous work. So I view it as an entry point into the brand, into the ecosystem to, you know, build that relationship with them. And then you can kind of branch out. And even if you change the subject matter, even if you change the genre, you know, they are attached to you in some way. So they're inclined to, they want to be interested in it. And if they want to like it, which is going to increase their likelihood of actually enjoying it. Um, and also I would say that it, it's not that hard to find common denominators at the end of the day, your common denominator could be that you don't have common denominators. So if every single one of your songs is a different topic, is a different genre, then shit, market your music to people who like extreme variety. At the end of the day, there has to be some sort of common denominator amongst all the music you create. So it just depends on your approach. If you're trying to get long-term fans, make sure the marketing that you're doing for your most recent single is also in alignment with the other stuff that you put out. If you're really trying to push that single, then you can dive deeper into the specifics of you know, the individual who would be most in need of hearing that song. I like that. I like that idea of the ecosystem with different entry points. And, you know, we we would think of it probably as, you know, different funnels that kind of lead into a, a whole big ecosystem, like you said. So I really like that approach. That's I think that's going to really resonate with artists. So, you know, when you do get into this paid marketing stuff, how can you really use ads to scale? Because I, so, I think I think musicians are very afraid to use ads, at least some of them, because they've been burned and, you know, burned money very, you can burn money very easily on ads. Yeah, well, I mean, it's weird because they're afraid to do it because they've done it before and it didn't work. So mm -hmm. I think more people should be afraid and more people should take caution before they just spend a bunch of money. What I'll say is, is that it doesn't make sense to market something that isn't already working. And if something is already working, then the marketing is essentially guaranteed to scale. So what I mean by that is like, first of all, if you don't have a product or service available, if the only way that you're monetizing your music is from streams, I can't think of a single marketing source out there where you're going to see ROI. You're not gonna see a return on your investment unless you're actually selling something. So first of all, make sure that you're selling something and make sure that the, unless the goal of, now we have to make this distinction. Some people really do do it for validation. They really do like to just have a number next to a song and they like to feel like a bunch of people are listening to them and they're less concerned with ROI. If that's the case, go market your music to whoever you want, go put it on a Spotify playlist. If your goal is seeing a return on your investment, if your goal is monetizing, the first of all, the marketing has to be conversion-based. What are you converting them to? Like, where is this point that you're taking them that's actually going to get them to purchase something that's going to allow you to see ROI. And then again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, I think the key is to do that organically. I think that if you're not, or if you can't already create a lead magnet on Instagram reel, you know, use that lead magnet to attract clients, nurture them a little bit, and then eventually convert them, then paying to have that reel be boosted doesn't make any sense. So the first step is to actually create an, an offer or, you know, if you want to convert, have something that's monetizable that, you know, is selling at a high enough price for it to make even make sense to be chasing customers for it. Once you have that, then try and generate those customers organically using organic marketing. And then once you're successful in that regard, that's when you would scale. That's when you would, um, you know, do paid advertisements and stuff like that. Now, at that point, it should be easy. Um, I think like bad marketing with a really good offer and like really good branding and really good like content and creative 
is going to still be a, a much better effect than really, really good marketing, but bad offer, bad brand. You know, you're taking them to a funnel that doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't require that much marketing knowledge to scale. What I would say is, you know, um, do a little bit of research on Facebook ads. One, you should already have customers. So find the common denominators amongst those individuals. So you understand what your demographic is. Who are these people that are buying and purchasing my stuff, listening to my music, whatever? What age are they? What gender are they? What are their common interests? Stuff like that. Then you'd input that information into Facebook um, and you target those individuals when running your ad. And then I'd say the only other thing to guarantee ROI is making sure they're going through the same funnel and process that the organic people went through that led them to make a purchase, right? So you have to understand that like, if someone enters your ecosystem three months ago and you're posting daily reels, and then three months later, you know, that's when they're buying the product and service, understand that it probably every single one of those reels got them a little bit closer, a little bit more familiar with you and what you do to finally get them to the point where they're comfortable enough to convert. So understand that it's not just running the the actual ad to find that individual in the first place. It's replicating the nurturing process that worked on the previous individuals. So what I'd say is once you see success organically, just replicate that process. Just try and find someone that looks exactly like the customers you already have and walk them through the exact process that you walked your current customers through um, in order to make the conversion. And there shouldn't be any reason why they wouldn't convert unless you're misidentifying something, unless you're forgetting something that you did along the way with those customers, some some place where you engage with them, where you interacted with them um, in order to get them to the point where they're converting. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. It's basically reverse engineering. And I do this all the time with email because it's much easier to do. You know, if someone buys my big program, be like, okay, how did they get here? What did they do on the way? Which emails did they open? Which, you know, which smaller products did they buy? All of that. Uh, how long did it take them? It's harder to do on social media. How would you track that with somebody that say was on Instagram reels or TikTok, and then like they bought from you, how can you figure out kind of what their journey was? Well, I think the key there is for your content to be intentional and in doing that in the first place, right? So I think that like, when you're posting those 30 reels organically to get your initial customers before you're doing marketing, the idea should be that those 30 reels are going to nurture and are going to convince that person to become a, a warmer lead so you can eventually close them. So over time, you should be able to speed that process up, right? Like, and sure, it's hard to know like which reels they saw and interacted with, but we can also study the analytics. Like Instagram gives us everything. It gives us how many people saved the post, how many impressions it got, how many people actually watched it all the way through, like how many people left a like, how many people left a comment, like use those analytics to gauge the success of your content and the success of, of moving it along. A lot of it is going to be intuition based. You know, you're going to have to have that figure it outness. but it's like, Hey, if you know, you've had this lead for months, then you post a piece of content and that's what causes them to DM you. And then you eventually book them. I would highlight that piece of content and be like, Oh, this is something that really pushed them over the edge. This is, and then replicate it. Right. And then post more of it. See if it, if that was just a fluke or if it does it again, like you're going to have to do testing in that regard. Um, but the content should be so intentional to target and nurture these individuals in the first place that you should be walking into it with that mindset, like walking into it with the mindset of already analyzing from the start, even when you're doing it organically, like what's working and what's not. Yeah, that makes sense. So what would you say to someone that maybe has just like a few hundred followers on a social platform? How can they get the numbers that they need to test things before they go out and and buy Facebook ads. Cause I think what I see artists do is it's like, oh, I don't have followers. So I'm just gonna go, you know, put money into ads so I can get this in front of more people. And it's kind of the opposite of what you say to do. Absolutely. Well, you know, you have to go back to what I said earlier and understand that if your content isn't bringing in new followers, then marketing that content doesn't make any sense. Your content isn't good enough to attract new people and to keep them there and to make them hit follow. So paying to get that content in front of people 
The issue isn't people seeing it. The issue is the content being good enough to actually draw them in. So you're always going to have to go back to the drawing board and you're always going to have to figure out how to make good content to attract followers. I would also argue that there isn't an ideal amount of followers that you need to be able to start selling. A couple hundred people, there are businesses that generate hundreds of thousands of dollars off of a couple hundred people, right? Mm -hmm. If you're able to identify the process to monetizing those couple hundred people, that's a lot more powerful than getting a thousand than getting 10,000, but only making money off those individuals off streams, right? Like figure out, put some merch out, figure out how to sell it to those hundred individuals. That gives you a lot of leverage. And then even if you do want to spend money in marketing and you fail, at least that's not coming out of pocket. You know, at least that money was coming from customers that you actually sold from your music, you know? Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying that that the content that we create needs to run the gamut. There needs to be some content that's really for getting followers and attracting people. And then there needs to be some content that's more for converting them and creating customers. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't imagine a world where you'd have a successful brand if you didn't have those components. Right. Like, and whether that's on Instagram, whether that's on TikTok, whether that's on your website, like the question is where, even if it's on Spotify, like the content on your Spotify is your music, is your profile picture. Like these things matter. It's like, where are we marketing people to, right? If it's an amazing ad and they're like, oh my God, this is, I'm going to click on this profile and I'm going to check it out. And then they check it out and the content isn't good enough to entertain them. Then it, none of it matters. Right. So it's like, where you're sending people when you're marketing has to actually be engaging. Now, the only exceptions would be if it's a direct to purchase thing. So if your offer is so incredible that the individual seeing the ad that has no idea who you are, doesn't need to know who you are and become more familiar with you in order to purchase your product or service, then you can just run a direct conversion ad where they don't have to go to an Instagram page. They don't have to go anywhere and be entertained in order to be engaged and stay there. I would argue that that's really hard to do. And oftentimes with artists, that's not the goal of what we're doing. We're trying to retain people and, and keep them as fans. So the idea is if, if you want a fan base, you have to have an ecosystem. First of all, you have to have a place where you can communicate with them, where you could show them content, where you could tell them that you're releasing, right? So that would be your social media, it's your Instagram, your TikTok, et cetera. If you are not entertaining on these platforms, then your post will not show up in their feed. They will not know when you're releasing. They will not know when you're selling products and services. They will just unfollow because of the fact that they're looking at your content and it's not engaging. They don't like it anyways. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, regardless of how good the music is, you're going, when it comes to your ecosystem and being able to communicate with your fans and tell them about what's next, you know, leverage those fans to make more money to even go out there and get more fans for you by telling their friends about you. In order to do that, that ecosystem itself has to be one we're staying in. It has to be one where the fans are entertained and they want to go back to the profile. They want to check out the most recent post because it's, you know, entertaining enough and intriguing enough for them. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. So let's talk about conversion, converting people to customers. Um, do you, when you teach musicians how to do this, is it more in DMs? Is it sending them to a page? Do you even actually encourage them to like get on the phone with people, all of the above? So definitely all of the above. Um, I think regardless of what it is that you're selling, it is going to be easier to sell it on the phone than it is over text. I think that that's a universal truth. Um, so again, it comes down to like a compromise and sacrifice thing, right? Are we going to compromise our money to save our time from hopping on sales calls or are we going to compromise our time so we can make more money by closing more by getting on the phone? And then it's also a priority thing, right? Like maybe the top priority right now is money, but once we reach a certain threshold, the top priority becomes time. So once we're, we've taken enough sales calls and we're making 5k a month consistently, like, and that's all we need to get by and, and make music without having to work another job. Like now maybe we could chill out a little bit and try and close more in the DMs and stuff like that because it's like, we don't want to scale more. We don't want to make more money. Like we just wanted to buy our time back, right? Um, so when it comes to converting, I would always suggest getting on the phone. Um, I think that there are instances where um, it's just makes more sense for you to try and sell online or via DMs. Um, instead of wasting your time trying to sell on the phone because you'd want to outsource that immediately. And and the only examples of that would be lower ticket stuff. So things like like under around like $200 or so, I'd say it's like, there's no point in getting on the phone 
for an hour to sell someone a $200 product. I mean, that's not a good value of your time. Like even if you have a hundred percent conversion rate, you're getting paid $200 an hour. That's, there's a ceiling to that, right? So if it's very, very low ticket, I would definitely suggest maybe hopping on that phone at first to understand sales tactics, understand how it works. Um, Cause that's the best place you're going to grow is like on a phone call, face to face, have to force to make a sale. Um, but the end goal would be creating some sort of funnel where, you know, the content um, and maybe the DM messaging that you have is strong enough to be able to close the sale without a face to face interaction. But with high ticket, I think it's the opposite. I think it'd almost be impossible to sell something for $10,000 without a phone call. For sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Phone call, Zoom, whatever it is that 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 works. But yeah, you're going to, yeah, you need to actually communicate with the person if they're going to trust you with that kind of money. Okay. Well, let me circle back because I do want to talk about your experience with, um, with live venues. You have a venue and you have a venue because you were very successful at booking shows into other venues. So what are your secrets? Like, I know everybody that's listening here is going to want to know, like, how did you do that? Because especially have you been able to do that since COVID and, you know, all that stuff. During, yeah. Um, actually, like I started hosting events during COVID. I'm, wow. I'm also in Florida, so it's like a free for all over here. Like, it, like you know what I mean? It's not like some place where it's like really locked down. Um, yeah, no, I'm in California. So yeah, total opposite. Yeah, yeah, total opposite, right? So I had a little bit of leverage from that perspective. But um, honestly, it's really not that hard. Like that's why it's I, I suggest so many artists to do it is because it's it's simple and it requires essentially no capital because you can book slots in advance and use that money to go out and rent the venue, right? So essentially it, it boils down to a few things. First of all, um, I think the first thing to cover is minimizing input, right? So understanding the ceiling for how many people are gonna show up to your first event. Um, you know, if you're not gonna have any more than 200, then don't book a venue that holds more than 200 people, you know? find the cheapest venue possible that can still accommodate the amount of people that you have. Some things to keep in mind with that are lighting, sound system, are these things that the venue provides or are these things that you're gonna have to rent outside of the venue and then compare those things. Okay, this venue is cheaper, but it doesn't have speakers. And if I rent the speakers from someone else, it's gonna add up to being more money than if I got this other venue that's more expensive, but it comes with speakers. So I think just minimizing your input, I think that the only things that are 100% necessary for an event to run, um, would be a venue, a DJ, sound system, lighting, and security. If you have those five things, everything else on top of that is a plus. It's not a necessity for the event to actually be run. So if you wanna minimize input, get those five things as cheap as humanly possible. Oftentimes, if, if you actually go out there and like just sit online for a little bit, you could probably find a DJ to come out for free, you know, to, get another gig on his resume and stuff like that. Like if you leverage your time in that regard, um, it should not be that hard to minimize the input. Um, typically um, for a starter event, I've seen people be able to get all those accommodations for between like five to $800. Um, and then the typical like minimum output from an event is uh, around four to five K um, for a starting event. So we're talking about like a, a $4,000 profit. If you're putting a thousand up front and you're generating five on the back end. Um, so in terms of the different sources of revenue, in terms of maximizing output, um, we typically, and you could do all types of formulas. I wanna, you know, I wanna keep this simple for the people who are listening. We typically do a showcase formula. Um, so that would be having local artists uh, especially if you're an artist yourself and you want a headline, let's say you're renting the venue out for four hours, you have a 30, 45 minute set at the end, the first three and a half hours are openers, right? You leverage that time and you sell opening slots. It is not hard. There are artists in every city. Like you go, you, you know, throw a pin on a map, there will be hundreds, thousands of artists in that city. There And a lot of them are willing and ready to pay for a show slot. And people say like, oh, I'm not in a big city. There's not a lot of artists here. I view that as leverage. If there's not a huge community of people already having events, of artists already doing things, then all the artists that are out there, the event is going to be more meaningful and valuable to them because it's not something that they see often. So when it comes to generating revenue from events, one of the biggest ways that you could do that is by booking opening slots. 
So I typically do anywhere from three to 10 minutes and typically charge 50 to, you know, $200 plus based on um, the value that we're providing through the event, right? Like how many people are going to show up, blah, blah, blah. Now, in terms of finding these individuals, if a lot of artists have friends, um, they go to studios so they can ask their engineers, like what, who the other clients are, like, again, with a little bit of figure it outness, it's not that hard. At the end of the day, worst case scenario, do some cold targeting. You will be able, out of the thousands of artists that live in your area, it comes down to a volume game. If you hit all of them up, 40 of them will pay $100 to book a slot for your show. That's $4,000, right? So um, I think that that's one of the main ways to maximize revenue from the show is by booking up a bunch of opening slots. I think one thing to mention there is um, making sure that you're providing value. Um, so we don't want to be charging people for some show where no one's going to show up. And right. so here are a few ways to provide value to justify actually charging for slots. And again, you can do the slots, like price the slots based on the value. So if you're afraid less people are going to show up, okay, charge 50 and not a hundred. You know what I mean? That, that's why we have a range. Um, but a few things, first of all, you know, as long as you're getting like 50 plus people there, you're good to go in terms of providing value because most artists that are paying for show slots. They're really desperately in need of a way that they could gain 50 new fans in one night, right? Um, not only that, you know, and also from that perspective, let's say you you book 25 slots, all you got to do is have each artist bring one friend and now there's 50 people there, right? Yeah. And just the network of artists is powerful in and of itself, right? Just booking 25 slots, even if no one shows up, you know, you being in a room with with 25 other artists, you know, um, I'm not saying, you know, to, to just do whatever with your show, but I'm saying like, it's, definitely up to the client a lot of times to extract value. Like I could, you know, I could make being in a room with 20 artists worth spending $50 any day of the week. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so don't be afraid to charge for your slots in that regard. And then also, I also like the ticket split formula where you give artists tickets um, and you just split the, the money with them. So if you're selling tickets for, you know, 15 bucks, they get seven fifty a ticket. You get seven fifty a ticket. What this does is it allows them to potentially make profit. It also puts things into their own hands. If they don't receive value from the event, then it's because they didn't go out there and they didn't sell enough tickets, right? It's lifting the responsibility from your shoulders. It's also incentivizing this, them to sell tickets because now if they sell tickets, they make money. So now more people are going to show up to the event, which is going to be more value for the other artists. Um, so it's all around a good idea to provide as much value as possible. I think a great way to do that is by splitting ticket sales with the artist. And then, you know, there's plenty of other ways that you can monetize the event. I would always suggest selling as many tickets as possible before the event. For some reason, I run into a lot of event hosts that rely on door fees, which I never understand why they do that. Sell as many as possible before the event. Of course, let people come in at the door. I typically charge a little bit extra at the door to incentivize them to purchase beforehand. Vending slots, if you're scared that enough people aren't going to show up, then do the vending slots based on commission, right? Like if a food truck, if, you know, you're afraid to ask them for $500 to come to your show because you don't know if $500 is worth the amount of money they're going to make back, just say, hey, come to the show and give me 25% commission of what you make. Um, shouldn't be hard to get vendors, if, if especially if you're doing it commission-based. Um, so ticket sales, slot sales, vendors, um, drinks. Um, yes, you do require a liquor license to sell drinks, so you have a few options there. If you go, if you you can seek out bars because since drinks are such a great way to make money, bars are charging like ten dollars a shot. Like you can come to an agreement with the venue owner and, and get a percentage of drink sales. Um, or there are legal options for selling drinks where you don't require a liquor license. Um, I would suggest doing your own research like that. Things like having a free drink come with the ticket and then just charging more for the ticket, you know, ways to actually uh, sell drinks without breaking a law, um, I think is a, is a great thing to look into because of the fact that drinks are really lucrative. And even if you go out there and get a liquor license, you know, add that to the expenses, walk through that process, spend a couple hundred dollars. The ROI on that is crazy. Like you'll, yeah. you'll see thousands of in drink sales just by having like a hundred people at an event. And then um, lastly would be selling photos and videos back to the artist. So getting hiring, uh, photographers and videographers to come to the event and record um, and then paying them a flat rate like hourly and then after the event offering different packages with uh, 
options of edited photos and videos back to the 40 artists or whatever who book slots. Okay, that's really smart because artists do need that kind of stuff. And and sometimes they're struggling to find somebody to video or find somebody to take photos. So that's a really great service. I love that. Um, what about if you're getting like 40 artists, are you allowing them all to sell merch at the show and like to get, you know, get fans on an email list and that kind of stuff? So these are things where, again, you know, you know, this is customizable based on, you know, the value that you're able to provide. So it depends. It's like if I'm charging them really cheap for slots, then I'm probably not giving them all these extra benefits. Now, if they're paying me $200 a slot and they're really serious artists and they're selling a lot of tickets, then it's like, of course, I want to provide them more value. I have to provide them more value to justify that price point. So these are, are variables that are going to depend um, on what you're charging and, and how many people you think that you could bring to the event. But what I would say first thing is you, you're charging for vendor fees regardless. So unless it's built into the slot price, you should be charging artists to have a, a vending there because that's a completely different benefit. They're, they're going from the benefits being making money off selling tickets and um, performing in front of a local crowd that they could potentially use to sell tickets to, to a next event and garner a new fan base. You're changing that value to like something that's way more something that has an upsell, something that, you know, drastically increases ROI. So it's like, of course, you're going to charge more when you provide more value. So either build things like that into the slot price, if that's what all the artists want to do, or if that's something that's unique to maybe outlier artists, which I find to typically be the case. Most artists that are paying to perform anyways don't even know how to set up, you know, a yeah, merge table. That's true. How to record, right. So with that being said, I think it's mostly going to be outliers. If it is outliers, just charge them an extra fee and maybe give them a discount on a vending slot because they purchased a slot for the show. You know, mm -hmm. I like that. That's cool. Now, are you are you curating these people? Like, are are you trying to keep them all like in a similar genre and or like, are you making sure that the artists are any good? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I would want not want to come to a show where it's like the one these people are R and B and these people are hard rock and these people are country. You know, well. It all goes, it, again, these things vary from event to event. You know, one thing to think about is the rest of the structure of the event. So for example, if I'm headlining, but I don't have a lot of fans and I'm not, and a hundred people are gonna show up because I booked 30 slots, but I only sold 10 of those tickets. And then most of the people there aren't coming to see everyone else perform anyways. They're specifically coming to see the artists that they bought a ticket for. So mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, if you're putting this event together and you're only booking R&B artists, it doesn't even matter because the people show up to see the artists they perform and they leave afterwards anyway. So they're not even staying to see the other people a lot of times. So again, it depends on the structure of the event and also personal preference. Like, you know, if, if, if you want to brand yourself as someone who puts on events where the artists are always really, really good, that has leverage for the future, right? That makes it so that when you're hosting events, you know, 10 months down the line, you have this kind of standard in terms of the artist. So, but then also you're sacrificing money in the short term because there might be people who would be willing to pay for a slot right now, but you don't view them as good enough. So you don't accept that money. So then, you know, you have to weigh out these pros and cons. That money is leveraged to build up your events and do more things in the future. So I would say, you know, if the whole reason you're getting into event hosting is to make money and it's not because you genuinely want to be an event host for the rest of your life and you know it's your passion then just focus on converting obviously you know it sucks that i have to say this but of course provide value do not scam people do not just sell them a slot and don't do any work to put together an actual good event but at the end of the day if you're optimizing for revenue and not like longevity or scalability and stuff like that then I wouldn't overcomplicate things and add limitations in terms of how you're able to make money. Hmm. Yeah, good point. All very valid points. Well, that's really cool. That's something we've never covered on the show that I know of. So I'm glad we talked that through. Um, we've had a really great conversation. So many ideas that I hope it sparked for people listening to the show or watching the show. So how can they get in touch with you if they want to check out your amazing content on social media or get in touch with you about maybe doing some coaching? Awesome. So uh, my personal Instagram, you can always reach out to me via uh, Instagram is uh, at cross DTW, C-R-O-S-S-D-T-W. Um, our company Instagram is a uh, dead period two 
through the period world. Um, you can DM us on either of those pages. And then our website is uh, dtwheadquarters.com. Um, if you just want to follow, you know, just follow. If you want to stream, you can look up Lil Cross on any streaming platform. If you're interested in the services in particular, um, definitely shoot me a DM. And that's the best way to get a hold of me quick. And we can book a call together and have a conversation. Cool. Awesome. Definitely go out and follow him and check out all of his great content and uh, all the other people that are working with you. So thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. I loved all these conversations, really deep diving into this marketing nerdy stuff. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really can, um, can't express uh, how grateful I am for this. You know, I, I am very passionate about helping artists and empowering artists and I love your platform. Um, you know, for doing the same thing. And it makes me very happy that, um, you know, you gave me a voice and hopefully uh, because of that, you know, some people's lives are being impacted. So again, I'm extremely grateful for, you know, you uh, giving me a platform today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.